Hi, my name is Gordon Hutchins. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Faculty of Medicine and Health for nominating me and the organisers of the conference for inviting me to talk a little bit about my research um, into bowel cancer and its aims of trying to improve the treatment of certain types of bowel cancer. Um, so, first of all, what, what is bowel cancer? And, and in this context, what do I mean by the bowel? Well, the bowel, in this context, means either the colon or the rectum. And so, of course, a cancer arising in any of these uh, any of these anatomical locations are, is considered bowel cancer or colorectal cancer. And colorectal cancer is a major worldwide problem. In 2008, there were 1.2 million cases diagnosed and 600,000 deaths. 600,000 deaths from the disease. In the UK, every day. 100 people are diagnosed with cancer, bowel cancer. And 43 people die every day. So it's a major problem. So how do we treat these patients? Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to feel, to feel to see the full impact of this because half of it's missing off the screen. So, um, well, it, it really depends on the type of cancer that the patient has. About 14% of the bowel cancer patients will present with localised disease, confined to the bowel wall. For these patients, stage 1 patients, surgery is curative because the disease is confined. In contrast, about 36% of the bowel cancer patients will present with relatively advanced disease that has spread to the lymph nodes. This is called stage 3 bowel cancer. And for these patients, following surgery, chemotherapy offers an improvement of survival. Of course, there is a subset of patients, 14%, who have very advanced disease, where the tumour has spread beyond the bowel wall to other organs, such as the liver. This is stage 4 disease. And generally, surgery or, or, or chemotherapy offers um, uh, symptomatic control, offers curative control in certain situations, but most predominantly a symptomatic control. So we, we arrive at a problem area in bowel cancer, which is 36% of patients who have a sort of intermediate type of cancer. They have a cancer which is locally aggressive, extending beyond the bowel wall. However, the tumour has not spread to the lymph nodes or spread to other organs. This is stage 2 cancer. And the trouble is, not all patients considered stage 2 have the same risk of disease recurrence, of their cancers coming back. And about 20% of these patients have the same risk of cancer recurrence as the stage 3 patients. So, how do we manage them? Should we use chemotherapy in stage 2 disease? Well, in the early 90s, in, 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 in an effort to try and answer that question, a trial was conceived called the Quasar trial. What this involved is taking just over 3,000 stage 2 patients after surgery, randomising them to chemotherapy or just watching them. And what this, this trial showed, that by giving chemotherapy to uh, stage 2 colorectal cancer patients, you increase their survival by about 3%. What that means is, you have to treat 100 stage 2 patients to cure 3. The vast majority of patients that you've just treated would have been cured by surgery alone. And there's a subset of about 17%, despite the use of chemotherapy, would have died anyway. So clearly, giving chemotherapy to all stage 2 patients is not justified, because the majority don't need it. Now, the benefit from chemotherapy is proportional to the risk of your cancer coming back. So, could we not identify all these high-risk stage 2 patients and treat them? How do we identify them? Well, currently, how it happens today in in St. James's Hospital and other hospitals around the country, we try and look for high-risk pathological features, aggressive features, such as tumour invading into blood vessels. The trouble is, these are extremely subjective, very poorly reported, and difficult to identify. So, in stage 2 bowel cancer, we need biomarkers. We need prognostic biomarkers to identify those at high risk that we can treat with chemotherapy or identify those at low risk who don't need chemotherapy. But ideally, what we really need is predictive biomarkers that will identify the patients who will definitely respond, avoiding unnecessary treatment. Biomarker needs is now big business in colorectal cancer, specifically stage 2 disease. 
You can now get your Oncotype DX colon from Genomic Health, which doesn't predict a response to chemotherapy, has very limited prognostic value, and will cost you £3,000 for the privilege, sorry, $3,000 for the privilege per test. Is that ideal? Well, I think there may be other ways. As part of my research, I've been looking to two, two specific areas which might help. DNA mismatch repair status, and something called tumor stroma analysis. The DNA mismatch repair system is a system that normally repairs errors, base mismatches during DNA replication. And mismatch repair protein expression is lost in about 15% of bowel cancers. And there's some evidence that this might have some prognostic value which will allow us to stratify patients into high and low risk. But it needed validating in stage two cancer. And this is what my research involved. So I took 1,900 patients from the Quasar trial, which I described a little while ago, which, which demonstrated some limited benefit of chemotherapy in these patients, and tested them with mismatch repair using immunohistochemistry, which is a very simple, reliable technique, which is used in pathology labs all around the world today, so it's instantly translatable into clinical practice if it's been suitable. So what happens is you take a bit of tumor, and you stir it up with the mismatch repair proteins, and most tumors will turn brown. The tumor cells here have turned brown, but a certain subset of patients won't stay. There's no brown staining in the tumor cells here. These are called mismatch repair deficient tumors. If you do that, and then look at the different outcome between the proficient tumors and the deficient tumors, this is what you get. Tumors that have retained mismatch repair expression have a much higher risk of disease recurrence. There's a much higher risk of the tumours coming back, whereas the ones that are mismatch repair deficient have a much lower risk. Mismatch repair deficient patients have a 50% less likely to have recurrent cancer. It's simple, it's cheap, it's reproducible. It identifies stage 2 patients with 50% lower risk of uh, disease recurrence. You wouldn't treat these patients, obviously. And this would spare, if you routinely introduce this across the country, this would spare about 3.6% of stage 2 patients, about 500 or so, from unnecessary chemotherapy. And because of the mortality associated with 5 FU treatment, this would avoid about 5 deaths. But you could take it further. What happens if you introduce it routinely around the world? Well, it would spare about 15,000 patients unnecessary treatment. It would save the NHS about £1.3 million pounds per year if you factor in the cost of treating with chemotherapy and the cost of the test. Imagine the cost savings worldwide. An added benefit is it, it identifies patients part of, that are part of the Lynch syndrome. And these are high risk families at much higher risk of diver, developing cancers at a very young age. This test could also have the added benefit of, of um, identifying those families. And these findings are also applicable to stage 3 disease, but obviously it needs, it needs validating in that setting. This is the largest study of mismatch repair status in stage 2 colorectal cancer in the world. We have published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology and taken it to conferences such as ASCO, and we've had a little bit of limited press coverage in the Yorkshire Post as well. So what about routine mismatch repair testing? That's, my, that's what I'm striving for. What about, what's the status today? Well, some centres in the UK are now starting to do it. The Royal Marsden, for example, in London is starting to do it. Um, certain countries in Europe and Australasia are, are advocating routine mismatch repair testing. And interestingly enough, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network of the United States now recommends routine testing for mismatch repair in all stage 2 tumours that are being considered for chemotherapy. And it's very satisfying to know that they cite our paper as one of the, the, um, as the evidence base for one of the evidence bases for, for recommending that. Very quickly, I'd like to talk about tumour stroma analysis. Bowel cancer isn't just made up of tumor cells. Bowel cancer also contains something called stroma, and this is the supportive network of the tumor cells that supplies the nutrients and the structural framework. And there's a lot of evidence in the literature that stroma and tumor, just simple measurements of portions inside the tumor, may be of clinical value. So we, we wanted to test this in the stage two setting, because argu arguably that's the setting that would derive the most benefit to patients, because that's the setting where there's most need for this sorts of, these sorts of biomarkers. We took 1,900 uh, samples from 
quasar um, child patients. We scanned them digitally and applied a digital electronic grid over the tumour area. And very simply, we looked at each point and decided, was it a tumour cell or was it a stromal cell? And by doing that, you, become, you, you derive a percentage of tumour, a percentage of stroma, and a percentage of other bits and pieces. Is the amount of stroma, if you look at a tumour from a colorectal cancer patient from stage 2, if, is the amount of stroma prognostic? Very. In patients with high stroma, they have almost 40% higher risk of disease recurrence in patients with low stroma. This is just a simple measurement of the proportion of stroma by looking at the slide. High stroma have, patients have a 40% more, are 40% more, more likely to have cancer recurrence than those with low stroma. But what about the holy grail? What about response to chemotherapy? Does stroma predict your response to chemotherapy? The answer is, it may well do. This is a little bit complicated, this is a forest plot. However, if you, there's a clear trend with increasing amounts of stroma, there is increasing benefit with chemotherapy. Increasing amounts of stroma, measured visually, predicts a better response to chemotherapy in these patients. So this, this data suggests that high intratumoral stroma has a powerful prognostic effect. High stroma, 40% greater recurrence. This is, the, this is the same prognostic power as that $3,000 molecular test that I was telling you about earlier, but it's certainly a lot cheaper. High stroma, high risk of recurrence, you would treat these patients. And it may even predict response to 5-FU, or chemotherapy. The reason I say may is because it was an unexpected finding. We didn't predict this, and of course, because it wasn't hypothesized in advance, we can't claim it's the, 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 the greatest thing since sliced bread in terms of response to chemotherapy, because we weren't predicting it. But clearly, further validation is required. And this is just a little taster of the data. So is tumor stroma analysis the perfect stage two biomarker? Well, it could potentially identify the 3% of patients who will respond to chemotherapy. It can certainly identify the low risk patients who will be cured by surgery alone, and it will identify the high risk patients that won't respond through surgery or through chemotherapy. It's cheap, it's simple, and it's easy. I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators in this work, and most of all, I'd like to thank the, the Quasar patients and their families for um, their generous, um, of, um, generously taking part in this trial. And I'd like to thank you all very much for listening, and I apologise for the technical issues.